Well, come on. And share. All right, where did it go? This is with chat chats and am I still sharing my screen? <laughs> I got to stop sharing my screen. How do I do that? Can you guys still hear me? Am I still sharing my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. I need to stop sharing the screen. How do you stop sharing the screen? Because <laughs> it disappears on me. There we go. Yeah. Okay. We figured it out. Yay. Okay, so welcome to Witch Hat Chats. It's sponsored by the Ever Moving We Rise Temple, the Life and Soul Holistic Center, and Moonlight Potions and Charms. So I am your host, Nikki Kirby, and Pam Griffith is our co-host, and we're known as the Witchy Ones. So Pam, what do you think about being known as the Witchy Ones? It's a little different, I'll say. Um, I guess it's, it'll be something to become accustomed to, I'm sure. Yeah, it seems like that, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. Well, so, Pam, we had the red tent last night. And how did you think that went? I thought it was great. We had a nice turnout. The subjects we discussed were from one end of the spectrum to the other, which was wonderful, getting a lot of good information out there. We were extra fortunate to have someone who was able to give us a lot of information on mar ma medical marijuana, which is now becoming the big thing. And she was able to give us informed information, which is really great because we don't get a lot of that. You hear a lot, well, so-and-so said, but um, she really knew her stuff. And I think we talked her into maybe doing a webinar or class so that she could um, expand upon that because it was interesting information. She was well presented and a lot of questions came out of it. Um, and one of them was back in the day during um, PMS times, um, they would drug you. That was their way of, of curing the problem. Uh, and this will go all the way back to the 1800s when it was women's issues and they gave you codeine heroin you know all the really good stuff so mm. that you were totally non-functional at that point Love but, um, yeah this is a way of uh, actually helping the process but not making us totally zombies so we had a really good time i am really looking forward to next month um i hope we can have more people join in with us um again it's nine to midnight and um we stop at the witching hour Yep, and that will be on August the 8th is when we will do that. And we also have our dark moon ritual tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All these are in Eastern Standard Time and everybody's invited. So even maybe our guests may join in. Byron? That's possible. We'll see. We'll see, yeah. All right. And what else do we have going on over at all of our sponsors, Nikki? Keep us up to date. What's happening? Well, with the Life and Soul Holistic Center, we have some new spiritual services being offered. 
um, spiritual coaching and mentoring is one of them. We also have a variety of spiritual services such as weddings and funerals and rites of passage um, being offered as well. So I'm really looking forward and I'm really excited about that. Um, we do have some new products at Moonlight Potions and Chimes. Uh, one of our new products, let me see about sharing my, here we go, sharing the screen again. We're going to share on the screen again. Let's see here. What screen do I want to share? Oh, there we go. I want to share that. That one is our altar on the go. As you can see, it has several different things for that. We've included the salt, um, the incense. You guys your little wand and your little knife and everything else. It fits into a very small can. So you can just pick that up. It's got a handle and everything. You just pick it up and you're on the go. You know, if you decide to take off and you need some place to go or anything like that. And it includes its own altar cloth. So it's a really nice thing. And then also we have, where is it? We have the Dammit Cat. And the Dammit Cat, I'm really excited about him because basically with everybody we have stress in our lives we also have a lot of anxiety and sometimes we can't seem to get that out properly so when that happens the demo cat is here to help you you just take them and you just pound them a few times until you can kind of get out your anger and, and everything like that and then he always makes you feel better because you've actually done something physical and it's, and it's a positive expression of a negative emotion so that really does a lot of good for releasing. And he's really, really cute. I mean, he's got his own little tail and everything. And then we have like for tonight, um, we have the Hecate candle. And with Hecate, I started to design most of the deities with no faces. Because each one of us, we have our own version of what the deity looks like. And so, um, thinking about that in that manner we can be able to place our own face you know on on our own deities so there's my little hecate candle uh if you could bring those up we don't see them we see the altar on the go okay oh shit. okay well wait a minute let me get over here okay altar on the go i thought i was bringing those up okay thank you for that awareness there we go there is the damn it cat right there. We're still on God. I'm still on the go. It's not let me do something. Why is it? Resume share. Yeah, resume share. Well, that cat went into hiding. We need to bring <laughs> him out. He must have run off. You know how shy he is. Mm -hmm. uh, he was tired of people beating him up, beating up on him. Yeah, I need to stop sharing, and then we're going to do the share now. Here yeah, we go. Yeah. We're going to bring him out. Where? Nope. It goes right back to this. Okay. We maybe maybe we can coax him out later on in the show with a little bit of tuna fish. We'll, we'll give that, that a shot. We'll give that a shot. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Am I still sharing? You guys still seeing my? Well, I'm seeing you. <laughs> okay. Seeing well, your face. You're seeing me, but you're not seeing my desktop. Right? No, honey, we're not. But okay. like I said, we'll bring Damon out later. We'll, we'll do that a little bit later. But um, now it's really time for us to bring out our guest host. You know, you may know this amazing lady from her regular column in Sage Witch, a Sage Woman, excuse me, Sage Witch. <laughs> Sage Woman Magazine. She serves her community as an activist. She's a senior Wiccan priest and co-founder of the Mother Grove of the Goddess Temple and the Coalition of Earth Religions, or SEAS. And a quote from the Asheville Citizen Times has her, as I, and I quote, her land-based spirituality is so rooted in the natural world that I can't tell the difference, unquote. Oh. Yes, she is a successful author of four books, including her first book, um, Stubbs and Ditchwater, a friendly and useful introduction to hill folk hoodoo. 
She's made several appearances at pagan conventions, including the pagan, pagan Spirit Gathering, Starwood, and Hexfest. And she is a co-host on the Weird Mountain Girls podcast. So known as the Asheville's Village Witch, she is here to talk to us about Appalachian folk magic and tell us about her books. And I am proud to introduce my friend, who is my sister, and she is our guest host, Byron Ballard. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Nikki. What a beautiful introduction. Thank you. So, Byron, yes. I was going to ask you, number one, what do you think about all these masks? Because it seems like people need to be wearing them, you know, like right now, people need well, to be wearing their masks. I think people need to be wearing masks, and I've got a whole bunch of them right here hanging on the chair. Here's a beautiful one designed by my friend, Melissa. Oh, that is pretty. Easy to put on, easy to wear. I don't know why this has become such a political thing, but it has. And it's just time for us to think about, do we love our community enough to, to protect them? Mm -hmm. And some people, that's just not an option for them for whatever reason. So I, I encourage people all the time to wear a mask or stay home. Yeah. And I'm really, I'm pleased with so many of the stores around Asheville. I mean, I don't get out much, just to be honest. I go to the grocery store, post office, bank, uh, Walgreens occasionally. And I've been really impressed with how much people are wearing masks and how careful they're being. If you go to the post office, well, it's just, it, they do a really, really good job. I'm very grateful for that because, you know, I'm shipping out stuff all the time, as you are, too, with all your products. You must be at the post office pretty often. So I'm very grateful for it. I'm not so grateful to our city, which has done everything it can to open up for the tourist trade because we're a big old tourist town. And so, you know, traffic is terrible. And none of the people visiting wear masks, hardly, which is a little yeah. depressing. But I think we need to do it. Wash your hands, put on a mask. Be careful with the people in your life, even the people you don't know, because we're all we're all related, all of us. There, it's a, little, sermon. It's, it's a little hard for us to not uh, to leave the planet to go somewhere else. So we're all in this together. We don't really have a choice. No kidding. I'm fortunate where I'm at in Florida. They do require masks in my town everywhere. Oh, you get cool. out of your car, you better have your mask on. So they're really enforcing that, but we've opened already. Yeah. It's, it's oh, just, yeah. Um, in the state of North Carolina, they've actually said, the governor said that he wants you to wear a mask. But, you know, it seems like I can't seem to get the young people to understand that this virus, it is real. And, you know, if you're not wearing a mask just because you're, you don't think you have it doesn't mean you may not have it or you may not be able to spread it to somebody else by accident not even on purpose and people you know what? that all should that all might just be darwinian so you don't wear a mask you kill off your relatives and then they come back either to haunt you yes. or they come back as ancestors and they are on your butt all the damn time That's either way they come back <laughs> Let's just be clear. You're not going to get rid of them. If you accidentally kill your grandmother, she will be with you the rest of your life. Yes, and in the afterworld, too. Oh, yeah. And it's a so, political statement. We can all make our own statements. Nikki, you had a really cute little one on there. Byron had a beautiful one. Make it a statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See what you're thinking on your mind. Yeah. And you wear it, and everybody sees it. Well, and my, so. friend, my friend Kate gave me one that's um, got a Ouija board on it. And I tell you what, I go in the grocery store and nobody says boo to me. <laughs> it's like, really? You going to yeah. mess with a woman in a headscarf with a Ouija board over her mouth? I wouldn't. No. And yeah. see, it can also protect you that way. <laughs> so I think it's a fashion statement. You can make them to match your outfits. You can have sparkles, of course. Mine's all sparkly. Um, you can have yeah, anything you have on it. Personality, Pam. Yes, well, Pixie does come out in her sparkles. But I think you can make a political statement with it. If you want to put the letters on it, whatever you want to say, you can wear it on your mask, just like your T-shirt. Yeah. 
So let's all get out there fashionistas. We need to make a lot of these masks. <laughs> well, Pam, you've made a bunch of masks, haven't you? I have made many, many, and mine are all gifted out um, for many of my friends who couldn't sew or many who were unsure of the pattern. So I've made them uh, several, um, especially some, I live in an over 55 community. Um, some of my neighbors are not able to, so they got some really fashionista ones from me. So we're going to keep it up and we're going to just mask everybody. It's, it's you go into a store, no shoot, no, no shoes, no shirt, no service, no mask, no service. Yep. Yeah. Real simple guys. We okay. try not to make it difficult. But again, Darwin will greet you on the other side if you so choose not to. <laughs> I'm telling you, ancestor worship is going to be a big old thing in the next year. Mm, oh, I'm, no, not again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I have a question for you, Byron. In your yes. book, Dobbs and Ditchwater, the uh, friendly and useful introduction to hill folks hoodoo. Yes. Um, we talk about the hill folk hoodoo. Exactly for those of us who didn't grow up in Appalachia, what is it? Well, um, I, I have been battling for years and years um, against phrases like, it's Appalachian granny magic. What I practice and what a lot of people in this region practice is a healing and spiritual set of technologies and processes that don't really have a name. So you can brand them, and that's what I've done by calling it Hill Folks Hoodoo, but it's really a practice without a name. And it was people, primarily women, but not always women, who served their very rural communities in specific ways. And they were the people who doused for water. They were the people who cotched babies, who could blow the fire out of a burn, all, the, all that stuff that we set aside for the most part when we all moved into town to work in the mills. And I grew up out in the country, so I still had access to a lot of people who did those things. And my family did not, uh, they did not condemn that because I, I grew up uh, happily unchurched, which is the way we talk about people who uh, did, didn't have to go, get baptized and go to church on Sunday. Um, so I got to be exposed to a lot of different types of healing, and some of it was spoken word, and some of it was uh, materials. It was herbal and otherwise materials, and so I have practiced that for a long, long time, and uh, oh gosh, several years back, I was invited to speak at a conference and I talked about Hill Folks Who Do. And I wasn't sure I wanted to teach anybody outside the region because I know what happens outside this region when people talk about us. I know it. And it's the reason I use Hill Folks and not Hill Billy. I don't like to use the word Hill Billy except among my own people. And it's like other cultural words that the, uh, that the group itself may use with each other but it may not be used by outsiders because when somebody from New Jersey says the word hillbilly, I know what they mean. Their subtext of that is paddle faster. I hear banjos and that's not what Appalachia is about. So I don't use the word hillbilly and I don't like anybody else to use it unless they're one of my people as it were. And even then it makes me a little uncomfortable. So I call it hill folks and <laughs> And then I use the word hoodoo and I get in trouble for this all the time with people. They go, you can't, you can't use hoodoo. That's Afro-Caribbean. You can't, that's, you're stealing that. That's culturally appropriative. Well, I don't think it is, but I use it because me and my cousin Dina grew up together and she used to refer to the magic in our families as that hoodoo that we do. So that's when it became Hill Folks Hoodoo. And I've written now three books about it. The third one is coming out from Llewellyn in February, and it's called Roots, Branches, and Spirits, The Folkways and Witchery of Appalachia. Um, 
So I've written three books about it and come to find out after my first book tour, you know, people still do this. I thought it was a dying art. They still do it. They just don't hang out a shingle on Facebook saying, hey, guess what? I practice granny magic. They just do it quietly for their communities and their families. So it is a living, growing tradition. Nikki, you laughing at me. Um, it's a living, growing tradition. And it is based firmly in Protestant Christianity. It is, absolutely. Now, I don't practice Christianity, Protestant or otherwise. And all the stuff that folks will tell you has to be done with the Bible, don't. But it is traditional that that's where it came from. Primary references are in Protestant Christianity. Have I talked enough? You want me to slow down so you can ask a question? Well, you know, you know, um, Byron, you remember when you and me first met? Yeah. Pantheon you know. in yeah. California. It had to be in San Jose, too. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I had to come all the way to California to meet somebody who just lives literally an hour and 15 minutes. up. The I know. Road. I just live up the hill from you. Yeah. It's crazy. And, and you know what? That day was one of the best days of my life. And I'm going to tell you why. I was feeling so out of place in California. Mm -hmm. Because in California, they're kind of completely different culture in, in a lot of ways. And when I found out that somebody who is from North Carolina, who's literally up the street from me, is going to be teaching a class in Pantheon, somebody who I never heard of, I thought, heck yeah, I need to go meet this girl. I need to go meet this woman. And I remember you talking about the marshmallow hex. <laughs> you mentioned about that. That is that is the best hex. I'm telling you, that works like a charm. You want me to tell you about it? Sure. Um, well, it, it has a backstory that I won't go into, but I developed this uh, hex where if you want to take away somebody's power and authority, you take a marshmallow, the bigger, the better. You know, they got those great big ones now, like that big. Take a marshmallow and write the person's name all over it. And with pencil, by the way, pencil's easier. If you use a felt tip pen, it'll ruin your pen. And you put it, you stick it with, uh, I like to use those big old thorns from the locust, black locust tree. But you can use uh, toothpicks. So you just, you, you prick that outside kind of skin on the marshmallow. And then you put it outside and you let the weather and the ants and whatever else take it away bit by bit by bit. Now, I always, this is my disclaimer about that. Put that up in the, in the crotch of the bough of a tree, but someplace where your dog can't get it or your young ones can't get it. And I've seen a squirrel eat all around the toothpicks, so it won't hurt them, but put it up in a tree. And especially in hot summertime, you will see the object of that hex get smaller and smaller and smaller, and sometimes literally smaller and smaller. And it's like you're seeing them in the rear view mirror as you go away. That is awesome. That is really awesome. I'm I telling you, it works great. Now, being from Appalachia myself, a lot of times we did what we did because that's what we did. We didn't, weren't given a reason and right. we did it because it worked. Yep. Um, I moved to Baltimore, Maryland, with my Appalachia accent and ways, and soon found out that in the big city, you were not considered very um, friendly by doing some of your little Appalachia things. <laughs> parts, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I do. I do. I'm being nice. Um, I returned there. I was just there. I was in Appalachia last month to visit my relatives. Um, I'm from a, a coal mining town in West Virginia. Um, so I read your book and I'm wondering, where in Appalachia do you do a lot of your research? Is it in just your area or do you visit other areas? Oh, I visit lots of other areas. In fact, um, I had a wonderful kind of field adventure up to Raynell. Do you know Raynell, West yes. Virginia? 
uh, I have some good friends up in that area and they set it all up for me and that I was going to come and talk about what, you know, this kind of healing and stuff. And I was really looking forward to just having an excuse to sit around with a bunch of primarily women and just compare notes. That's been the best part of it is sitting down with other people who do it and comparing notes. And so we, we get there to Raynell and, um, half the people who had said they were going to come, you know what they got in, in Raynell, West Virginia, they got the Google. And we were really careful not to use the word witch. Um, but all you have to do is Google my name and a whole lot of that stuff's going to come up. So about half the people didn't show up. And then I, and then I started unpacking mason jars full of stuff for us to talk about and share. And these women who were there started calling their friends saying, now, Barbara, get over here, because this is exactly the stuff your grandma did. No, I mean, get over here. So about half again of the ones who didn't show up initially came wandering in because it it feels familiar, you know. And so things can vary. I mean, literally, they can vary from cove to cove because most of that stuff is passed down through families. So my family was in this one particular cove and the next cove over was also a different branch of that family. So all of that was pretty similar, but I can go into the next county and it's gonna be a little bit different. Um, yeah. But the, as they say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So just like you said, if it works, people will continue to do it. And they'll do it just the way their mama did or their grandma or their great uncle or whatever, because they know that that thing is gonna work. I've noticed in a lot of um, newer witches books, they cite things that we knew back in the day when we were little because grandma showed us and you read it and you go, wait a minute, that's been around forever. How are you claiming that's new? Oh, I know. Bless their little hearts though. <laughs> you know, they'll come up with, oh, did you know? And you go, yeah, I've known that since about 1967. But yeah, I'm glad you found it. You never would have listened to me saying it because I look too much like your damn mama. But, you know, if you can come up with it for yourself or if somebody that you figure is a big name pagan says this is a brand new thing, then you just glom onto it and do it. But, you know, people ask me all the time, how how do you how can I say I'm a witch? How do people say they're a witch? Well, here's the thing about witches. You have to practice witchcraft. That is the bottom line. If you don't practice witchcraft, you ain't a witch, period. And I talk to so many people. I teach a class, Lord of mercy. I teach a class called Simple Practical Magic. And I do that for two reasons. I do it for all of those people, those especially young or new witches who, who you know, they think they've got to do some big ceremonial thing in order to get a result. And so simple practical magic is that. It is folk magic, very easy, good, simple, easy results. I teach that class for new people, but I also teach it for all those people who think they know magic, but they never practice it because it feels too complicated. Mm -hmm. And you all know those people. Nikki's oh, yeah. nodding. We all know those people. And I remember in the class, you were raising so much cane about this. <laughs> because there will be people to turn around and say, well, I'm a witch, but we only practice at night. Or we only practice during the dark moon. And you're like, oh, oh, no, 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 no. You practice every single day. As a matter of fact, I do parking spells. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Well, in that class, I tell people, instead of, you know, reading in some fake grimoire about how to conjure a demon, which you don't damn need. How about you figure out what you need? So if you got to go downtown in Asheville, North Carolina, you're going to need a parking spell. So just go ahead and figure out one that works. There's just plenty of them that work real well. Figure out one that works and use it all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I find again and again with people. They feel like they have to save magic for a special occasion. You know, like your good panties. I'm going to save those for that special occasion. Well, what is the point of that? The only way you become adept at something, you become an expert at it and really good at it, is if you practice it. Whether it's playing the fiddle or cooking cornbread or practicing magic, if you don't practice it, you will not be adept. 
And right now, frankly, with the world the way it is, we need all the magic workers we can get. And not just people who wear black from head to toe and they got a big old necklace of bones and, you know, a lot of black eyeliner on. you got to have people that are actually down and dirty doing the work. Really? And this is, I'm not taking anything away from ceremonial magic because I know it is a beautiful, beautiful craft. And I, I was, I, I, uh, I volunteered to do a piece in a book called Women's Voices and Magic. And the editor contacted me and she said, oh, we'd love that. We don't have any essays on low magic. And I was like, oh, low magic. You mean the kind of magic that works magic? That magic? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, since then, I've gotten a little less uh, hoity-toity about it. But Jason Miller, some of y'all know him and his work. Jason Miller has a wonderful way to describe this. He calls it temple magic versus field magic. And I used to refer to what I do as MacGyver magic. And I was really glad when that TV show came back on because I would say that sometimes at festivals that I do MacGyver magic. And they go, oh, is that like a traditional Scottish thing that you do? And it's like, no, it was a TV show where you stick your hand in your pocket and you got some lint and a piece of dental floss and a, I don't know, whatever. And yeah, that's how you do the magic. So, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, when you do magic, you don't need, you don't have to have a candle. You don't have, to have a wand. Here's you your tools. Have, Here's yeah, your tools. Just, just this way, you know. And yeah. the one thing I love about your books is they're so easy to read because it's like sitting down and having a conversation with you. <laughs> Everybody says that. That's, that's the way it's like because I remember I bought your books at Pantheon. You only had two out at the time, I think. Or was that one? No. Three. I had three out, I think, at the last time I was at, at Pantheacon. Well, I wasn't there the last time because I was here, you know. So, that's right, that's right. Yeah, so the, the other two times you were, but each time I had bought your books and I read them, and I really, really, really enjoy them because I enjoy the writing. You, you're talking to people as if they're people. You're not talking to them like, like you're the high person here and you know everything. You're talking to them like they're regular folks. And I really do, you know, enjoy that. And then getting to know you, that's so much fun, especially when we start drinking. It's even, <laughs> it's even better. <laughs> so um, I remember, I see the last book that I, I purchased your last two books. And one of them I read was the Earth... Um, Earthworks? Earthworks, yeah. Yes. That's my most recent book. Yeah. So when you were writing that, was it, what was the inspiration for that book? <laughs> oh, golly. For many years now, I've had this premonition vision about what I've been calling tower time. And y'all may have heard of that from other people. But I originated the phrase because I've been uh, I've been reading cards for 50 plus years. Pam, when we were talking about how long we've been practicing witchcraft, I was just like, yeah, yeah, half a century, at least half a century. Um, and so I, I had this vision. It was a waking vision that all these top down hierarchical systems that we've lived with for thousands of years that we are in the nexus of time when they are collapsing. And it is incumbent on us to recognize that this is an opportunity and it's a chance for us to go in and correct things that should have been corrected thousands of years ago. So it's based on, of course, the card, the tarot card of the tower and of the collapse that occurs when that happens. And we've seen it happen historically again and again and again, but we are lucky with the hindsight that we have about history to know that when the fall of the Roman Empire happens now, as it is happening, that there are things we can do. So that's what this book is about. And I, I taught it, I preached about it, I did, I've been beating the drum of tower time. We got to get ready. We got to get ready for years. This book came out in 2018 in the late summer. And then all of this hit in 2020. 
So people have been saying, wow, you really did. You knew what was going on. How did you know that? Well, a lot of people knew it. A lot of people knew it and a whole lot of people didn't listen. So now here we are and we're not prepared. And we could have had, we could have had more influence than we're having now if we have been prepared for the collapse of systems. But we are seeing systems collapsing, every top-down system, government, education, healthcare, religion, they are all collapsing. Now, some of them, most of them are recalibrating as they collapse, but make no mistake, they are collapsing. And if we are ready, and it's what I call circles on the ground, if we are ready, we can come into these systems and we can set up alternative systems that are what we need, that are fair, that are egalitarian, the on, that honor the earth and that honor our fellow beings, regardless of whether human or otherwise. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> but that's what it's about. And the beginning of it is all about essays about that collapse. And the last part is all rituals and ceremonies of things that we can actually do to create rites of passage as we go through these difficult things. Wow, that gives you a real, a lot to think about. It really does. Okay, uh, it's time for our song. And as many of you are aware, of course, with the coronavirus epidemic, pagan musicians and groups depend on live performances and record sales to make a living. Unfortunately, right now, many of them are not doing so well because they cannot get out because everything is being canceled. So each week, Nikki and I select a song from a pagan musician or a band and display their music video or the song. And this week, we are really super proud to introduce the music is called Zen on the Beach. It's by ELN, who not only writes and does the music, she produces some of her own music. So we're all going to sit back and have a nice little video. Nikki? <laughs>
And we are back. So welcome back to Witch Hat Chat, sponsored by the Ever Moving We Rise Witten uh, Shrine and the Life and Soul Holistic Center and Moonlight Potions and Charms. So before we begin, I am the little damn it cat. He came out. He's going to play with us. Yay. Yay. Is everybody excited to go see the damn it cats? All right. Finally, we got him out. Come on. Yes. Bring him on. Here's our damn it cat that I am sharing mm. right now. He is very, very cute. Like I said, he helps you with your stress and your anxiety. And, and just grab him and just start smacking him down. Damn it, cat. Damn it, cat. Damn it, cat. That's what you keep saying, you know. And then he'll come back and he'll love right back on you. So isn't that cute? So anyway... We are with Byron Ballard, and she is going to be doing a reading for us um, from one of her books that is called Earthworks, Ceremonies, and Tower Time. Is it backwards? Nope, looks good. Good. No, looks right. <laughs> you ready? Mm -hmm. Yep, we're ready. I'm going to read you all a little bit from chapter one. Going to ground, love in the time of towers. I don't remember precisely when it all began, this quiet knowing that has grown for me into a certainty. It began with a pinch of insight, a glint of what was happening globally, reflected in local events. It was more than a lack of harmony, of simple chaotic modern life. This feeling hinted at larger activity, a shift in the zeitgeist, a disturbance in the force. At Sacred Space Conference 2017, I arrived within a half hour of the first talk I was scheduled to give. The people's craft, folk magic and its peasant roots was supposed to be a rousing exploration of some of the commonality of, of, po of folk magic across different cultures and the fascination with those practices among modern pagans. It turned into a sermon focused on resilience and the power of revolution. It became a plea for pagans to see clearly what must be done for our biosphere and our species. Pacing the large room, wearing the same battered jeans I'd traveled in for nine hours from North Carolina, I preached as my Methodist forebears did I invited the attendees to consider peasant life. I brandished a pitchfork. Tower time. It has become my mantra as well as my ongoing vision and occasional nightmare. It has been in front of me for a decade or more since the day I sat on a friend's sunny porch drinking wine and comparing our notes. That seems like a faraway dream now, a kinder time a time less fraught and more hopeful. In brief, I have come to know through unverifiable personal gnosis, dreams, visions, ponderings, discussions with colleagues, that we are living in the times when the top down and toxic systems that some of us call patriarchy are in the process of collapse again. Because I am a lifelong tarot reader, the image that returns to my mind again and again is the tower, sweet number 16. The clear knowing that I felt has grown more insistent in the intervening years. It is this, we are living in times when these massive ancient and toxic systems that have both created civilization as we know it and doomed it are crashing under their own weight of history and grief. It is the death throes of patriarchy that we are experiencing and it will die as it has lived in violence and oppression and injustice and death. Madness, 
friends and co-religionists opine that I have been seduced by cyclical end of days hysteria, that I'm guilty of buying into the ever increasing wall of apocalypse noise from conservative Christians, or that I'm cleverly fear mongering for control of my social media followers. Ah, I've heard it all, but I've also heard concurring murmurings from colleagues as far afield as New Zealand. This feeling, this strange knowing is visiting others of my kind. We are, as the Cheshire cat purred, all mad here. It is concerning, confusing, and rather exciting. Fast forward to the recent unpleasantness of the, ninth, of the 2016 election cycle and the subsequent fear and lethargy that have beset so many of my friends and colleagues, my congregation, my neighbors. Interfaith groups gather in ragged circles, loathing the news, weeping for the future. Social media is rife with hand-wringing and angst. Systems failing, toppling institutions, grappling with their own demises, recalibrating as they fall, as they morph into new systems, ones that serve different masters. The visions of Tower Time have never been solely about the collapse, which I want to stress early on and to return to throughout the first part of this book. This is not a gloom and doom scenario. I invite you to explore the next steps the best step. As the tower falls, it is incumbent on all of us who can act to create what I've been calling circles on the ground, active and well thought out alternatives to what we've come to know. Alternatives that work where you are, that include everyone that take planet and people into consideration. We have been trained to abhor vacuums, we humans, and power vacuums most of all. The easiest thing to do is to insert a new kind of savior, the perfect strong man to see us through. It's a very old pattern, a pattern I'd like to see broken once and for all. Hierarchy is such an efficient system and easily reinstalled. It will take foresight and planning to not reinstate the very systems we want to change. We will have to look beyond jargon and comforting platitudes, the news speak that has become a permanent part of every news cycle at every news outlet. And it will take weaving new connections and possibly redefining who and what our tribe is. That is uncomfortable work, the sort of work that leads us to consider our own personal ethics and our priorities, as well as our own mortality and limitations. And I'm going to stop there in case you have any questions. Oh, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Byron, for that. Thank you. <laughs> and this was, I want to add, this was two years before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. This was before we've seen the worst of what's happening with the current administration. Oh, this yeah. was before the death that sparked the Black Lives Matter movement revival. It was before all of that. So those are our niches. Those are the holes. Those are the places we can go into and we can transform the world if we'll do it. Yeah, we, you know, the thing about us um, people that we do magic, magical work is, and I've told people this, number one, you can change things in your life. That's the whole point of magic, okay? There's things that you can change. You have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in your magic because I have heard so many people tell me, oh, I practice magic, but I don't believe in it. I don't believe in my magic. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, excuse me? You're sitting here, and then they wonder why it doesn't, you know, manifest or either I tell them I said when you do something you need to just do it and ensure to yourself yes it's done it's done properly and then let it go don't sit here and and, and think oh my god is it in the next hour is it going to come around is it going to come around because this ain't Hollywood 
Okay, it's not going to be charmed and it goes sparks goes everywhere and suddenly you have, you know, whatever it is you want. You know, we actually have to work for it. That's what spells are for. You know, it's not something you go, hey, let's blow out a candle and and, and maybe I'll get that hundred bucks I, I really need for my rent and then just sit there and do nothing, you know. So um, I really did enjoy that book. Actually, I'm still reading that book because for some reason with that book you went into a lot more detail and and I um it's not like your other books that I've read where it's just you know a casual conversation it's just really really into detail and I still love it I still absolutely love it um so um you have a podcast called the Weird Mountain Gals so tell we, us about we do, that. We do. And y'all, it is y'all, weird you, when, you, when you're actually listening to it, because I listened to it the other day. I finally got a chance to listen to it. That was, that was on my list. And I listened to it the other day, and I'm like, yeah, this just sounds like we're sitting down with, you know, me and Byron just sitting down having tea, like we always have. And we're just having this little chit chat, you know, back and forth. So tell us about that, hon. Well, we are having so much fun with that. Um, my friend Alicia and I, we sing together sometimes and we are both Western North Carolina girls. And we wanted something, there's a wonderful bluegrass group called the Clinch Mountain Boys. So we wanted something that would sound like a bluegrass group. So then we came up with Weird Mountain, the Weird Mountain Gals, like we could be this kind of bluegrass group. And we keep threatening to to do an album and one day we will I, I promise you it will get we will get to it but we wanted to do a podcast where we talk about Appalachian folkways but we also talk we want to bring them into the future and not not think about them as this kind of frozen in time foxfire thing that doesn't occur anymore and so if you tune into the podcast and you can find links to it on our Facebook page which is weird w y r d Weird Mountain Gals, we, uh, we come out about once a week and we talk about just different things. This last one is about the Sears catalog and outhouses. And it all is based on our personal experience. But we also, you know, we talk about politics and tourists. We talk about all of it. Um, and at some point when the, when the Rona loses her grip on the country, we're gonna make a, we're gonna make a little uh, road trip we're going to go to all those places like Rock City. We're going to go out to Cherokee. We're going to go to all those Dollywood, all those places. It'll be fun. But it's a it's it's a fun thing. And we have a couple of pro, little products. We've got a, a a calendar like the kind you used to get in the feed seed store. We got one of those that we sell through uh, Asheville Raven and Crone, which is our local beautiful witch store. And um, and we're creating some magical oils too. So keep a lookout. You get you an apron, you can get you a calendar. Lord knows, we're Mountain Gals. We're here. We're here. We know no fear. Hey, why don't you guys do moonshine and then I'll be interested? <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm not going to comment on that on, a, on an open channel, my dear. But we could talk about that privately if you would like. I think she's calling your bluff, Nikki. <laughs> I'm sure she does. Well, I, I, all I, I can say is that I laid in a supply of a gallon of locally produced alcohol for tincturing this year. So there, there you go. Oh, yes. It's funny. Your books um, are tied together, and I don't know if that was intent or not, but you have one. We are now in the tower. We are coming down. But your book, Embracing Willendorf, uh, which is way of loving your body to health and fitness. I think that this book is just as important because now we are having all of the stress and, and everything that's going on in our society is like the tower. We're crumbling. Yeah. And I think we need to call upon women more to start taking care of ourselves. Absolutely. So I, I have to ask, did you plan these books together or did that just, <laughs> no, it it, leading you? it's the progression of my life. I, you know, I, I wish I could say, oh yeah, there was a grand plan. 
I knew after I did the first folk magic book and took it out on, on the road that there was more I needed to write about that. So that, that made sense. The Willendorf book actually was the first book I'd ever written to completion. And that was much earlier. Um, in 2002, I lost uh, 80 pounds. And I did it by loving my body and listening to it. Because diets, you know, diets never work. In fact, they do the opposite of what we think they're going to do. And so I, I started doing workshops about loving your body. And it, it's, I'll be honest, it's primarily women and gay men. And they're the people who I think have been so broken about their physicality over the years. And, and the, the book is primarily aimed towards women. And I apologize for that. Now I'd love to have the time to go back and rewrite it so it's a little more inclusive. But it's basically about loving your body and loving all the parts that you've been taught by the culture or by your family or whoever that you can't love, like loving your big old powerful thighs or your big feet. Or, I mean, right now, my problem is this thing right here because I lost all that weight. So I've got a lot of loose skin. and I've got these kind of wings when I'm sleeveless and I'm learning to love those. But that's been the tough part. And it's all about once you love it, you'll start listening to it and you give it what it needs. And that's what the book is about. People joked when it first came out and they said, oh, God, is this like witches, Weight Watchers? Because I just can't. And I was like, no, it's about it's about this is a machine that requires certain things. And if you give it what it requires, you'll be rewarded with health. And if your health is good, I don't care how much you weigh. If your health is good and you've got energy, you can do the work that is your heart's work to do. Mm hmm. I mean, that's one of the reasons why um, the Ever Moving We Rise Temple, we started our red tents, was to, you know, teach women how to enjoy themselves, enjoy their bodies, and how to take care of themselves, basically, because we're taught as women that we need to take care of everybody else, and we are always last on the burner. However, the thing about it is, here, here's what the rub is, is being last on the burner Who's going to take care of you? If you don't have the energy to take care of you, how can you have the energy to take care of your children, your parents, you know, everything else that you need to get done? You, so, can't, drink, you can't dip from an empty well. Right, right. And so um, that's, I think that's one of the very hard things, you know, especially with being a female. And I remember years ago when I was going for my psychological, psychological degree, my psychology degree, I wrote a paper called you want a piece of me and i took that lyric from um byron not not byron yeah i'm just looking at you and i'm thinking about you honey um britney spears because that song had come out when i was writing that um paper and it was talking about how the media shows women and how with women if you are in the united states if you're not a size four you're considered to be overweight or and obese okay yeah and in the UK, it's a size two. And then, you know, I was taught, I went into details about how um, the Barbie doll, a lot of people want you to go and be a Barbie doll. Well, you know, Barbie doll is really impossible to be. She's impossible to become. Um, we women, we all come in all different shapes and sizes and and everything like that. So it's um, really important. I really did like that book. Well, and the reality of any of that is that we can never we can never achieve the cultural standard physically. So I lost a whole bunch of weight and then everybody wanted me to get my teeth fixed and to wear contact lenses and to do something about my damn stringy hair. And it's like, so you can't you can't just do one thing because the culture will come down on you. And the reality is it's none of the culture's business. And mm -hmm. the sooner women can come to the place where they go, if you don't like my body, you don't get access to this. It is a hell of a thing to get access to. Mm -hmm. So it is important for us, especially as women, but to go back to what you were saying about taking care of ourselves, when you fly in an airplane, you know, the, the attendant will tell you there's the bathrooms and if we lose pressure in the cabin, this mask is going to fall. And you are to put your mask on first and then take care of anybody you're traveling with. So if you're traveling with children or elders, you put your mask on first. 
everybody I know would go, uh uh-uh, oh no, my baby gets the mask first and then grandma gets the mask because I can function with a little bit of brain damage. And that's how we've lived for centuries. But I am telling every woman I know, put on your damn mask. And I mean that now, literally, as well as figuratively. So just put your mask on because you can't help if you are empty. And we see it happen again and again, especially in tight knit communities, in the magical communities. We see people that suddenly get named big name pagans. Everybody's listening to everything they say. And eight months later, they have withdrawn from society and they're writing trash novels because they just can't keep up with the demand on their energy and time because they didn't put their mask on. And I know in these frightening times that we're having right now, I think it's more critical for a woman to take care of herself because let's face it, she's hearth and home. And if she goes down, the rest of the family goes right with her. Um, I see that a lot now where um, the child care now that if you're working from home and you have a child, you're trying to, you know, those lovely little kids do make those little screenshots every once in a while while you're on the phone. Um, but it just seems that we're not thinking about that. We're thinking about, well, we've got to get this project done. We've got to get that done. And then we've got to take care of the kid and then we've got to do this, but then it's, where is our time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think we need to learn a little selfishness and be a little selfish and take that me time. Sacred selfishness. Yes. I, I really think that should become a thing. Yeah. Where yeah. We, we do that because I don't see it happening. And now with everything falling apart, um, and everybody getting laid off and, you know, unemployment. And and now it's, it's, it's not a trickle down, it's an explosion down where everything is happening. And here, honestly, mostly women are the ones that are picking up the pieces. And that's probably been true culturally for a long, long time. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, with me, I've got two businesses. I have a temple. I'm running this. And I'm also taking care of my mother as well. So I have to even stop myself and take care of myself for, you know, whatever the amount of time is. And that's really hard um, a lot of times because I hear the, the old saying, you know, you're selfish because you're taking care of your your needs over somebody else's and usually the people that are telling me that they're the selfish ones nine times out of ten <laughs> they're, well, they're the ones that want something from you mm-hmm. you're being selfish because they want a piece of you mm-hmm. like like i said do you want a piece of me <laughs> yeah exactly now you've written a few books now and they're pretty awesome um Somebody, I've heard it said before, and I've started writing a book a dozen times, and it just sits there, I know, um, that writing a book is a labor of love. How much <laughs> yeah, you you're certainly not going to get rich writing books. Well, maybe some people do, but I, I am unlikely writing nonfiction about folkways. I'm unlikely to ever get rich doing that. But uh, I think at heart, I'm really a teacher. And if you write a book about that thing you talk about all the time, then that's one more person that you can hand that information to. Um, and, and it's stuff people can take away with them. So I teach, I mean, it's so funny to think about having been home all these months because my schedule this year was going to be a killer schedule. It was going to be like, 18 or 19 conferences, festivals, and then some pagan pride days thrown in. And I would have been on the road almost every weekend, all from spring until November. But because everything got canceled because of, of, of Rona, um, I've gotten the opportunity to be home and write and garden and do that kind of self-care that I didn't do at all last year. And it's important for all of us 
to find the thing we love and do it however we can. And to do the work that I call, that is your heart's work. And sometimes, sometimes that is being a bank teller. Sometimes the thing you love is making sure that people who are on the margins get the kind of home loan that other people would get. Sometimes that is your heart work. Sometimes your heart work is growing the most beautiful roses or, or figuring out a way to heal the sick. But it's, this is the opportunity now for all of us to figure out what our heart's work is and to do it in whatever ways we can. Did you hear the thunder? We've got a storm coming in here. <laughs> yeah, you know, the thing about it is I was talking to Lori, who has another temple up, um, up above me, and she said it was really raining there yesterday and she's like did you receive the rain I said you know what I said here I said it, it sprinkled there was <laughs> no real rain so I had to go out and water my plants and I was kind of ticked off because I had to go out and water my plants when it's supposed to rain you know? <laughs> <laughs> I did a little bit of watering this morning when I was out picking beans but I'm hoping we'll have a, a good soaking so I don't have to water tomorrow I'm ready Where to start doing my fall planting we're in monsoon season here in Florida, oh. so that means every day we get a nice thunder boomer come through and it just torrential downpours like it does in Florida. Um, so we've gotten a lot of water. We got hit yesterday at the beach, so that oh. was lots of fun. I know, but you're wet in the water anyway, so it wasn't <laughs> so bad. <laughs> Well, see, here's the thing about it. I'm not complaining anymore because I used to live in California. Right. In California, it only rained during December, January, and February. Right. Yeah. And, but see, here's the thing about the rain. They would say it was raining cats and dogs outside. And I would go outside and I'm like, this is mist. <laughs> this ain't rain. Huh. You know, and, and they're like, oh, my God, it's raining cats and dogs. Is, and I remember being on the phone with my mom as I was driving because I was a vendor at the time. And I would be driving to different types of, of stores throughout uh, Northern California. And I remember um, it raining. Well, not raining, but I mean, you know, it would be um, in a mist. And I would be saying... It's only mist. You can go through it. It's okay. And my mom's like, why are you saying that? I said, because people in California, what they do is they stop when they feel this wet stuff and they look up and they're like, what is this? Where is this coming from? And I mean, they literally stop on the road for nothing, nothing. And so it's like, okay, I know you're not used to rain. <laughs> it is wet. We can drive through it. You don't. You don't want to sit here and go Speedy Gonzalez through the stuff. I know you don't want to do that, <laughs> but it's okay to drive through this, and you don't have to get out of your car and wonder what's this stuff in the sky. You don't have to wonder that. <laughs> so you know, I told my mom. I said I, I'm not even complaining about the rain anymore. I'm just glad that we have it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes we do get too much of it, but. You know, that's just something that I'm kind of glad for now because with, with rain here, it cools everything so much down. And it's oh, so yeah. And I know it's really hot in Florida because she's closer to the what is it, the equator than I am. And so, and she has worse flashes than I do. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's um, right now, it's like 95 outside. Ooh. And uh, we had rain this morning, so it's all misty now. So it's all high humidity. Um, my hair used to be down to my waist um, when I moved here. They took an 18 inch hank off of my head. Um, I sent it to Locks of Love because I'm not using it anymore. It was just too much to handle here. Um, so I'm on like almost no hair at all. Um, I moved here for my health. One of the things I did finally do selfishly, um, I have lupus. I was living in Baltimore and the cold does not mix with that. Um, I can honestly say here, I've not missed a day of work with my lupus because I'm in the sunshine. 
So that was pretty awesome. Um, but uh, that was a selfish move. And everybody was like, well, why are you leaving your kids? My kids are grown. They done grown up. I kicked them out. I wanted empty nest syndrome so bad. I prayed for it. When I finally got it, I kicked them all out. And I'm like, I'm done with y'all. They are fully functional on their own. And the grandchildren started having babies. They're fully functional on their own. So I said, it's time for this witch to go and do for her. And I really caught a lot of flack from certain family members that I was being selfish. And I'm like, no, I can be around a whole lot longer if I take care of me. Mm -hmm. And up north, I couldn't take care of me. So I get now that I need to be selfish. I did too many things up there, uh, pushed my health, physical and mental, because you're, you're hearth and home. You know, you're the everything and it takes its toll. And when it takes its toll, you can no longer do it anymore. So it, it was, it's a real shame, but women, unfortunately, men don't go through this. You know, I had an opportunity at a job where I would travel during the week and come home on the weekends. Excellent job, great benefits, great pay. But mommy can't travel Monday through Friday, but daddy can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, like, yeah, right. That's going to work out well. Um, we women are, are just pulled apart in too many directions. We can no longer be at home and running the household. We need to work. Unfortunately, many of us are single moms or you have to work because you're just not making that kind of money. You know, it's not living above your means. It's just making your means. Right. I was really blessed. My husband had a good job, uh, worked for the the city and um, and I and because of that I could have a part time job, but I had the kind of job I worked in a bookstore, where if there was no school that day, then she just came with me, and we would build her a fort out of boxes of books that hadn't been unpacked, and she would have snacks and everything was just it was just as good as it could be. I don't know what we would have done with this virus back in the day. I don't I don't know. Yeah, my yeah, late husband. Mine's grown up. She she lives far from here. Yeah, my late husband also worked for the city, but he unfortunately passed mm -hmm. um, prior to retirement, and oh. I had to work. Yeah. So it it was it's eye opening for women. I think you hit a certain age and you think that you're set. You know, the kids were out of the house. We were set. It was the two of us, and then I had to bury him. So oh, it was, it was difficult, but it also made me, I guess, a little stronger again. I'm always been an alpha female, so I can never say I was ever a weak <laughs> child. <laughs> um, no one could ever say I wasn't an alpha, um, but it does make you stop and think. Um, Self-care now I'm on my own is extremely important. There is no one to come and bring me a bowl of chicken noodle soup, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm, I'm very much, when I read your, your Willendorf, it just, it resonated with me because it's like, yes, we need to do this. Mm -hmm. This is extremely important now. And we need to preach it to those young girls that, you know, you think you've got immortality. It doesn't work that way. And these young girls are, I know, and I'm saying young, I'm saying women in their, 20s and 30s and 40s that are working two jobs and trying to make that American dream come true. And I, I'm going to look at them at 50 when I'm bearing them. Mm -hmm. So I, I, your Willendorf book was really, it was a confirmation of what I know, but it was somebody else saying, look, listen, pick up that book, read it, find out why. And it was a confirmation of, yes, I know all this stuff. My goodness, I'm not yeah. silly. But to have another woman say to you, you need to wake up. is a wake up call. It's, it's funny about that book because it's kind of a sleeper success. Um, the other books sell more copies all the time, more copies. But that book changes people's lives. And 
that is extraordinary to me. But I've had so many people contact me and say, I read the Embracing Willendorf book, and this is what I did for me. Mm -hmm. and, and it changed my life. And, and a, a writer and a teacher can't ask for more than that. Yep, yep. I mean, they can't. And, you know, speaking of traveling, I heard that you went to, what was it, Ireland a few years ago? Oh, yeah, I've been there several times. Um, I, I try to go to the British Isles or Ireland every other year. I was supposed to go this year, but alas. <laughs> So um, you were going for research or you just go because it's pleasure or? Um, well, both, obviously. Um, but I've been, I've been doing spell catching. You know, the song catchers from the last century, uh -huh. they came into Appalachia and they discovered that a lot of the Appalachian ballads were really old English folk songs and Scottish and Irish folk songs. So I've been doing the same thing with folk magic and tracking it back to its roots. So I've been doing a lot of work in the borderlands between Scotland and England, uh, in Ireland. And then I go to Cornwall for pleasure because I love Cornwall. <laughs> I love to travel, which is one reason it's not a hardship to have the kind of schedule, travel schedule I usually have. Because mm -hmm. I just love, I like to go. I'm like a do big dog. I just like to go. So do you have any last um, comments for us or anything like that? I do. I want to say this to everybody that's watching. It is easy to be afraid right now and to kind of withdraw our energy into ourselves and to fret and worry and be anxious because, frankly, the world is chaos right now. But I really believe, I firmly believe, that these are the times we were made for, that we're here now for a reason, because we are the ones who can use these opportunities that are presented to us. So when I sign copies of Earthworks, I sign it, fear not, fear not, behold. Awesome. Thank you so much, Byron. Thank you all for having me. It's been a pleasure. You've been wonderful. And you know what? As soon as this virus lifts and everything, you may need to get together and have a little cup of tea. Uh-huh. Tea. tea. Yeah. Tea. Yes. Tea. Tea. It may well, thank not. you all for having me on. I really appreciate it. Pam, it was wonderful to meet you. It was wonderful to meet another Hill sister. That's right. The Hill folks. <laughs> ah, so thank you so much, Byron. You continue to, to make a difference in your life and others. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye. And so right now I'm going to go ahead and that was able to get the Hecate um, candle to come up. So there she is. And the Hecate candle. Um, as I was saying, when I started to design deities now, most of them, because we do have different um, views on who our deities look like, I'm just going to do it like this, and that way you can be able to put your own little um, face on there and everything like that. So that is the Hecate candle. And um, I just put in a little bit of um, a sense of humor with Hecate because she does have a sense of humor um, by putting in the little dotty dog over there. <laughs> and so now it is time for our... Um, witch's cabinet so pam what is in store for our witch's cabinet today well you know you were all talking about having tea so much that it just brought out the tea in me um we were talking about self-help and self-love and i really loved the book that byron wrote on the willendorf because it is something we need to do now with all of this corona going on everybody is super super stressed um, the actual art of just making the tea can help reduce your anxiety, believe it or not. Everybody knows chamomile and lavender is great for relieving stress. But did you know that peppermint tea is also a great stress reliever? I have a little peppermint tea here. I have my tea bag in here. 
and I crushed or bruised a few leaves of mint to put in here. Now, this is not a tea I recommend for drinking before bed because the peppermint and any kind of mint is gonna give you a little extra energy. This is a great mid-afternoon tea if you're at work or if you're at home and you just need a little pick-me-up. Um, you just let it steep a little bit and then we make this wonderful, I use lots of honey. So I have my honey in there and you just pour it out. I use a green tea and I'll explain why because green tea is already full of antioxidants and all of that good stuff. So I prefer green tea, but you can also use a valerian root and believe it or not, valerian has actually been called nature's valium and it's an excellent root to use. Um, lemon balm, if you like a lemon tea, is wonderful. Um, we know the lavender, and if you're using the base of a green tea, I see she sent her thunder down here. I am now experiencing thunder here, so Nikki, if we cut out, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, rose hips, if you have a rose bush out there, please save those petals in the hips. You can do so much with them. The petals are edible and the rose hips make a wonderful relaxing tea. Um, it's loaded with vitamin C, believe it or not. So it gives you a little bit of vitamin C there. And lastly, a passion flower tea. That was used by the Incas and the Aztecs and the South American Indians. And it's a great source of alkaloids and it also helps to reduce your stress chemicals and it'll leave you feeling great. It is also great for sleep. So, and it helps relieve inflammation. Many times the reason you can't sleep at night, you're not listening to your body. As Byron told us, you have to listen and you may have some inflammation going on. So what my recommendation is, I'm using the mint tea because I still have, it's only 2.30 here Eastern Standard Time. I still have the rest of the day to get ready for work tomorrow. So enjoy your tea anytime and make it stress-free. Back to you, Nikki. Uh, thank you, Pam. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, a great another great thing about mint tea is it um, helps cl um, clarify things for you too, because it kind of helps clear the mind as well. So um, that's a lot, another reason why I would use um, the mint tea. But that was awesome. Thank you. Tea bags. See, I got my little teacup. See, I got my teacup. Uh, yeah, wrong kind of tea. <laughs> but it I is, believe that's it called is. mountain tea. Okay. <laughs> mountain tea, honey. <laughs> Don't think that's kind we're going to sell. <laughs> well, actually, there's passion. It's called um, passion tea is what it's called. Mm. And so I drink that every single time before we start here. Um <laughs> is if you have stomach issues this is going to help mm -hmm. if you have IBS um, irritable, any kind of digestive issues a little mint tea will go a long way worst comes to worst you get your headache you use your mint on your forehead or get rid of your headache yep a lot of yep. wonderful hill uses for this stuff oh yeah oh yeah well that ends up being our time for today thank you so much pam for coming on and co-hosting with us and showing us about tea time. yes and next week who do we have on next, next week next we week. have star and raven hawk she is <gasps> going to be our um guest hostess and um also, we want to make sure that um, everybody, you wear your mask, you stay safe, you take the safety precautions, because we want everybody to be healthy and be able to be ha happy, and so we can get back to a life that we all like to live. So, and the only way to do that is to be able to follow the proper precautions. So, we just can't wait to see you back on our show, so we need our audience to wear yeah. your mask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway everybody continue to make a difference in your life and in others and Pam and I will be back next week on Sunday at 1 p.m. right here where you found us okay see you next week <laughs>